Good evening. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for the program this evening. The program this evening is co-sponsored by the Department of Political Science, as well as the William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications at KU. My name is Michael Scott, and I am a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The SAB is a bipartisan group. As a member of the SAB, I get access to many great KU student and are interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this evening's event, if you would like to know more about our guest, the event itself, upcoming institute events, and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the YouTube event description. At the end of this evening's event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guest. Please type your question in the YouTube chat box on your screen. Please hold all questions until the end of the program. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Questions that are distracting, disrespectful, or attempt to dominate the chat will be deleted and the user will be removed. This evening's program is closed captioned for the hearing impaired. And now, please join me in welcoming Director of the Institute, Bill Lacey. Thank you very much, Michael. We appreciate that. I want to welcome everyone who has come tonight to listen to uh, what I think will be an entertaining and great program and want to uh, give a special shout out to the students who are members of Professor Gaston's journalism class. We're delighted that you could join us tonight. Uh, it's my great honor to host uh, for, it's been several times at the Dole Institute, the founder of the Cook Political Report a uh, good friend of mine and America's foremost political prognosticator, Mr. Charlie Cook. Charlie, great to have you back at the Dole Institute. Thank you for having me, Bill. I'm sorry, I'm just a digital Dole as opposed to a physical Dole again. Yeah, well, we would have loved to have had you at the building, but uh, circumstances, obviously, uh, this is a lot wiser and smarter. Well, um, we've got a midterm start. election coming up, and I'll be happy to come out or pres next presidential. I'll be there. Count on me. Fantastic. We appreciate that. Uh, let's start with uh, getting a little bit more information about you. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in following elections and forecasting them? Sure. I was uh, grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. I was a high school debater and got recruited to work on a Senate race. So I did that my senior high school, uh, came up to Washington to go to college. And uh, I got a, uh, a job. Uh, people are going to laugh, uh, but you know this. Uh, uh, back in the old days, they had these elevator, manual elevator things in the uh, Senate office buildings in the Capitol building. So the second semester of my freshman year of college from uh, 7.30 in the morning till uh, 12.30 uh, every day, I would uh, uh, run this elevator six days a week and every fourth Sunday uh, and attempting to go to class in the afternoon. So I, uh, you know, got involved in politics, worked in campaigns, worked in a polling firm. And by the early 80s, I'd been on the Democratic side, but I found myself voting for Republicans almost half the time. And I wasn't becoming a Republican. I was becoming a swing voter. And I thought, well, you know, I, I, I don't want to work for either side, but how can I make it a living? So I took my $6,000 out of the Senate retirement fund and my father-in-law co-signed a bank note for $10,000 from a small bank in Mississippi uh, that, uh, uh, where, where he had grown up and started a business in 1984, which is pretty much when I think when, when you and I first met. And um, anyway, it's kind of you know, struggled for a while, then took on and there are now six of us and uh, um, you know, I've been lucky to be able to do something that I love. And, uh, um, you know, it's just I'm glad to hold down a job for 36 years. Uh, it helps when you're your own boss. Oh, yeah, that's most impressive. And I'm going to encourage I know there are a lot of political junkies in the audience tonight. I'd encourage you to go to the Cook Report uh, website and check it out. It's an extraordinarily valuable uh, publication that you can subscribe to. Let's start with a little bit of additional context, Charlie. Talk a little bit about what happened in 2016, because I think it caught a lot of us off guard. And I just 
as we go through tonight, I think it's good to start with a reminder of that. Well, that's that's a perfect place to start because, uh, you know, they say uh, generals fight the last war. And I think in politics, we tend to uh, wage the last campaign. And we look at every campaign through the lens of what the last one was when usually they have nothing, you know, very little or nothing in common. Uh, I, I think, and, you, and you're absolutely right, uh, I was surprised like uh, most people were by the outcome. Uh, but, you know, I think there's some big, you know, that was an election that was between a Democratic nominee with the highest unfavorable ratings of any Democratic nominee in post-World War II history against a Republican nominee with the highest unfavorable ratings in the, of any Republican nominee in, in the post-World War II era. And one of them was going to win no matter what, and it was uh, it was a fascinating election to watch. I mean, for example, you had 19 percent of the electorate had a negative opinion of both of them, and you think, well, what if somebody doesn't like either candidate? What do you think they're going to do? Would they not vote? That'd be plausible. Would they vote for a third party or independent candidate? Maybe. Would they split down the middle? Maybe. But would you have expected that they would break for uh, one candidate for, for Donald Trump by a 20 point margin, 49 to 29? And, uh, you know, that's in the late breakers, that's what they did. But I think the biggest thing, there were so many things that we could talk about about 2016, but the biggest question that I get, or most frequent question, is why, were, why do you keep citing polls? Why were the, you know, the polls were all wrong? Uh, uh, the poll said Hillary Clinton was going to win. Well, wait a second. Um, first of all, which polls said that she'd win the Electoral College? And the short answer is no, because that's not what national polls do. They measure, as Bill very well knows, the national popular vote. And the average, if you look at, if you got up in the morning, election day morning, and you looked at real clear politics, for example, you would see that Hillary Clinton was averaging 47% in the national polls. And, and Donald Trump had 44%. And when every vote was counted, she got 48, he got 46. So the polls were off by, you know, about one percentage point, the national polls. But I think we got spoiled. Um, you know, we all intellectually knew that you could win, someone could, one per candidate could win the popular vote and the other win the Electoral College. You know, it had happened in 1876 and again in 1888. It didn't, didn't happen again for 112 years till 2000, but even in 2000 when it did, Al Gore won the popular vote by about a half a percentage point nationwide, about a, half, a little over a half million votes. George W. Bush won the Electoral College vote, but it was based on Florida and 537 votes there. So one barely won the popular, one barely won the Electoral College, and people looked at it like, well, maybe it's a once a century statistical fluke. Uh, and, you know, we had had so many close elections before, you know, 48 Truman Dewey, 60 Kennedy Nixon, 68, 76. I mean, we keep going, but they all went the same way. All the others went the same way. And even the next one in 2004, Kerry and George W. Bush went the same, John Kerry and George W. Bush went the same way. Um, and then Obama won the next two. And so we come into 2016 thinking that there was still a pretty close relationship to between the two because there had been. And suddenly we real see that they've become disconnected. And uh, simply put, Republicans voters are more efficiently allocated around the country than Democrats are. You know, if Hillary Clinton wins California by a 4.3 million vote margin, and all you need is one more than the other guy, then 4.3 million minus one votes are wasted or 1.7 million in New York or 950,000 in Illinois. Meanwhile, Republicans, the states that they win by big percentages typically are small to medium sized states and the big states they win, they win by smaller margins. And so now we know, we didn't know this before 2016, but that a Democrat probably needs to be ahead by three or four percentage points nationwide before that's likely to translate into individual states. But one, one last point is that the polls were off, the national polls were off a little, 
most of the state polls were actually fairly much on target. Uh, you know, about 47 states went more or less basically the same way we expected, but the three that were wrong were, you know, Michigan that uh, had gone Democratic six times in a row, and Donald Trump won by two tenths of a percentage point, and Pennsylvania that, that Democrats had won six times in a row, and Trump wins by seven tenths of a point. And then Wisconsin, where Democrats had won seven times in a row. And, and, and Donald Trump wins by eight tenths of a percentage point. So fewer than 78,000 votes out of, out of uh, uh, 137 million cast nationwide. But when the, the professional organization of pollsters looked after the election and say, okay, what, what was the deal with the polls? Were they right? Were they wrong? And if they were wrong, how were they wrong? And they went back and they looked at who specifically was interviewed in those many of those national and state level polls. And they ran those by the voter files where you could see how some, I mean, not how they voted, but if they voted. And what they found was there was a small, but sort of basically systemic undersampling of whites with less than a four year college degree and an oversampling of whites with a four-year college degree. Now, Donald Trump won all kinds of people who probably walk across the campus in Lawrence and find you know, African-American and Latino and Asian PhD, people with two or three PhDs that voted for Donald Trump. But his strongest group was whites with less than a four-year college degree. That was his best demographic, particularly men. And anything that was going to underrepresent those, undersample those, was gonna was gonna underplay his numbers, and so now pollsters now they learned a lesson from that, and now they're carefully weighting their numbers to make sure that they don't undersample again. And one question is, but what if another group comes out unusually big, like maybe maybe uh, college educated suburban women or something like that, then suddenly they get, 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 could get out of whack, maybe even the opposite direction. So anyway, it was a heck of election, but it was, but you know, that was a choice election. And when you have an incumbent, it's a referendum. It's up, it's about the incumbent, as, as you know better than I do, it's about the incumbent. It's not so much about the challenger and uh, it's a different animal. Okay, let's go back uh, to February prior to the South Carolina primary. It looked like the economy was booming. Nobody knew what COVID-19, well, some people knew what COVID-19 was, but in the general population, we didn't know what COVID-19 was. They were all PhDs was. or MDs, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And the economy was booming. It looked like the president might be running against Senator Bernie Sanders. I mean, what was your assessment of his prospects prior to the South Carolina primary? Well. Uh, you know, there's the, uh, the old joke about the woman was asked by a friend, how's your husband? And she replied, compared to what? Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that my theory has been that you look that it, these things, when you're, it's an incumbent, it's a, it's, it's a referendum, up or down. Do you want to renew a president's contract for another four years? Yes or no. And it's primarily that. And, and uh, now, you know, if Democrats had nominated Bernie Sanders, we'd probably would be having a very different conversation right now. But the thing is, the best predictor of whether a president's going to get reelected or not is the job approval rating, because this is an up or down, extend the contract or not. And when you step back and you look at, at President Trump's uh, uh, numbers since taking office, you know, first year in office, if you take the Gallup poll from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, all of it, and back in those days, they were doing 500 interviews every night and rolling the sample every three or four nights, uh, moving average, that the president's approval rating was, was for the year, for the first year in office was 38%, a 38% approval rating. And that was the lowest approval rating for any post-World War II elected president. In fact, the previous low, was Bill Clinton, whose first year had been at 49%, 11 points higher. So uh, then we went to the second year and the president's approval rating was two point, had gone up two points for his second year to 40%. Well, that was the lowest second year of any elected incumbent in post-war history. So then we go to the third year 
and it goes up two more points to 42, but Jimmy Carter had slid down beneath him at 37, so he wasn't the lowest, but he was the next to the lowest. Um, so um, the thing is that the president's numbers were in a real danger zone, and when you look back at post-war history, and we use Gallup simply because they're the only ones that have been doing this for the entire post-war era, but you had five presidents that had had a Gallup job approval ratings in the last poll before the election. Five of them had job approval ratings of 50% or higher, and every one of them lost. And you had two that had approval ratings under 40%, uh, George H.W. Bush and uh, Jimmy Carter, and they both lost. And you had one in the middle, in the twilight zone, and that was George W. Bush when he was running for re-election in 2004. And you remember right after 9-11, boy, he was up at 90%, and he was up in the 80s, 70s, 80s for a really long time. But as the war in Iraq started grinding on and getting more and more problematic, his numbers were coming down. So his last Gallup job approval rating before the election was 48%. And you remember that election day with John Kerry, Heck, in the morning, the exit polls looked like Kerry was winning. And I mean, but that was a really close election. So you, 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 if you're an incumbent, you want to be over 50, but man, you really want to be at 47, 48, 49. And the president uh, aver has averaged 41% since taking office and was at 43% last week. So the thing is, he at least theoretically, or I think more than theoretically, he was very vulnerable, but... Um, you know, would he have lost to uh, uh, would he have lost to a Bernie Sanders? I, you know, in the absence of a coronavirus, uh, probably not. I mean, that's that you know, but you know, so I, I mean, I think it is it is in a referendum, but there are limits to every rule, and I think Bernie would have been pretty problematic as a nominee, and, and Elizabeth Warren for that matter too. Okay, well, let's. Uh... Let me add a caveat here before I ask you a question. We know from our experience uh, that things can change literally overnight in politics. But as of today, how would you handicap the uh, the presidential race? I I think um, I think people ought to be paying a lot more attention to the U.S. Senate and the fight for control of the Senate because uh, you know you we now have uh, you know 69 pay, million people have already voted. Um, You've got uh, um, the presence down nationally by about nine or 10 points and sort of the, 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 the higher quality, the live telephone interview polls that you and I uh, trust more. But more than that, um, and, and in the key states, um, in, you know, there are 232 states, I mean, I'm sorry, 20, Hillary Clinton carried 20 states with 232 electoral votes, which is 38 short of the 270 you need. So she has, he had, she got 232. And then she lost those three, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, by eight tenths of a point or less. So for Biden, he's now comfortably ahead in all 20 of the Hillary states plus, plus uh, DC. And then in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, he's running four to eight, four to nine points in sort of the higher quality polls, uh, which is a, you know, that's a decent lead uh, uh, in those states. But the other thing, and, and then there are three more states, and all these are states that, that President Trump carried, but Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina, where uh, Biden has, you know, a tiny lead or tied, but right, generally he's ahead by more like one, two, three points, but not a big lead. And then there are four more behind that, Georgia, Iowa, Ohio, and Texas. Now, Texas, the presence ahead generally four or five points, but these others are real, real, real close. So I, I think he's a, a, a pretty much of a long shot, but let me, poll, let me point to a non- a non-polling metric. Now, if, did you ever, well, I shouldn't ask you this, because, okay, I'm gonna ask it rhetorically, not ask you personally, because um, you probably shouldn't answer. Um, at the end of September, the Trump campaign, Republican National Committee combined had a $61 million cash on hand, September 30th. 
the Biden campaign had $177 million cash on hand. When have you ever seen an incumbent Republican president at a, that kind of a deficit, uh, $116 million short? And then here's the second one. As of Friday, I'm waiting to get the newer numbers. The Biden campaign had spent this year $576 million on television, 576 million. The Trump campaign has spent 341 million, a $231 million difference. Now, we both remember back in March when the Biden campaign didn't have two quarters to rub together and money was gushing in to the, to the Trump campaign, uh, what happened? I think as we got a little deeper into the coronavirus pandemic, the president's approval ratings were sort of fluttering in April. The approval ratings started going down about the 1st of May, but Biden was still holding a lead of around four, five, usually about four, five, six points nationally. So it, it, it's a steady lead, but it was a very competitive race. The, the president was still within striking distance, particularly when you consider that a Democrat probably needs to be winning by three or four points. So that was still a real race. And then you started seeing the approval rating in April, and then you started seeing the gap with Biden, uh, between Biden and the president going from that four to six point range to eight to 10, peaking out about 12 before the conventions. It narrowed back down to 10 to eight, and then we had the debate, the first debate, and pops back out. And, you know, the, I guess the first poll came out right after that was a NBC Wall Street Journal poll that had Biden 14 points ahead. Now that was taken the first two nights after the debate, which is probably you shouldn't be doing one quite that fast. CNN came out next at 15 points. Then the Fox News poll came out that had it at nine points among registered voters, Biden ahead by nine, by 10 points among likely voters. And basically it's been nine or 10 points since that debate ended, but you saw the president's money fund, uh, fundraising. Well, let me back up. Back in the spring, you know, he, they, they made a interesting decision to not go after swing voters, to just not, and to, Basically, we're gonna, we're gonna solidify our base and we're just gonna crank our base out to the nth degree. And they made, I think, a, prud you know, a decision, that was a, a good decision probably, that we're gonna plow an enormous amount of money into registering people in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, who are exactly like the friends, the neighbors, the spouses, of the people that voted for President Trump, for Donald Trump in 2016, the people that were just met the, met the profile and sort of grow that. Well, that was probably a decent decision, but they made those decisions based on assumptions that the money would still be coming in at a huge rate. But starting midsummer, when the president's poll numbers start had had been looking pretty bad suddenly the, the revenue starts coming short and they had invested all this money in an organization, which was a good decision, but the revenue projections turned out to be wrong. And here they are in the general, I mean, we just read this, this evening that uh, the president's pulled most of his advertising out of Florida. Um, that's not a strategic or tact. I mean, that's what you do when you're short of money. And so I think, you know, I, I don't want to say it's, over, but it, it's 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 um, it's pretty tough. Okay, we'll we'll move on to the Senate in a few minutes because I do want to talk about that. But uh, you you kind of hit it in that last response, Charlie. But um, let me ask it a little more specifically. You can add what you want about Trump and Biden. Kind of give us an overall assessment of the campaigns that they're running. Uh, the Trump campaign, like you said, has had money issues, which, uh, as you suggest, is a complete shock to me. From my experience, I don't ever remember anything like that for an incumbent Republican campaign. Uh, the Biden campaign was criticized for, uh, you know, keeping Biden away from everybody. 
everybody, but it seems to have turned out to the right strategy. Well, you know, the thing is that, um, you know, you go back, you were talking about going back to a year ago or 10 months ago. And the, the, to me, the Democratic Party, it, it's got two pieces. There's a 40% that really likes Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, and they want fundamental systemic change. They want to, they, they want to change a whole lot. And the other 60% are just more relatively conventional liberals. And, uh, and they primarily just wanted to beat President Trump. And they were still, all of them were traumatized by the 2016 election. But the 60% over here, I mean, they knew they didn't want a Bernie or Elizabeth, but at the same time, they were split up. I mean, they, they knew Joe Biden. Philosophically, they thought he was fine. They liked him, but they thought, A, he's too old, and B, boy, does he make a lot of mistakes and, and has had two, you know, two presidential campaigns shot out from under him before. And, and he's called himself a gaffe machine. And so Democrats were, I mean, they were looking at Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg and Mike Bloomberg and heck, they had, they had uh, what, uh, well, there are 23 total. So call it 18, 17, 18, 19 out of this column over here. And they, I think part of it was they allowed the perfect to be the enemy of the good. They were looking for the perfect nominee and nobody's perfect. But they also, there was a real reluctance to go with Joe Biden, but it wasn't until they, uh, and the, 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 the conventional vote was pretty much getting split between Bloomberg, uh, 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 Klobuchar, Buttigieg, and, and Biden. And Bernie Sanders was on the verge of nailing down the nomination on Super Tuesday. And the party just said, well, you know, that's, that's not a good idea. And they just shoved out the other three candidates and said, we just have to go with Joe. And they went with him and he didn't have any money. He didn't have much of an organization at that point. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they, I mean, they, he, the people joke about him being in his basement in Wilmington. Um, but for someone who does have a propensity to make mistakes, uh, that's not the worst thing in the world. But also, you know, the look, you know, you look at the polling data, that, you know, Democrats, it's wearing masks, it's social distancing, it's we've got to control the virus and then worry about the economy afterwards. And then you look at the Republican side where, you know, it's a more liberty, more uh, freedom, uh, self-reliance, and um, um, don't like to be told things. Uh, and it's a completely different culture. And so while President Trump is certainly a unique individual, um, a Democrat, I think a Democratic electorate wouldn't have wanted their, their, their nominee to be out doing big rallies because that would be against what the way they see things. And Democratic Democrat campaigns had not been knocking on doors because most people that are inclined to vote for a Democrat don't want anybody on their door during a pandemic. On the Republican side, it was like, well, I mean, at least with the, the Trump campaign, it's full, you know, let's just full speed ahead. And it's just different cultural differences. But uh, in a perverse way, the circumstances, you're absolutely right, did work to, uh, to Joe Biden's benefit. There's not any doubt about that. Um, but, um, uh, um, you know, I don't think I, I'm not a Grateful Dead fan and Bill, I kind of doubt if you are either, but what was that song? Uh, well, it was an album. Uh, what a strange trip it's been. I think it was on, um, I don't have a brother-in-law, it's a deadhead, but somebody's going to write a book about Joe Biden's campaign and how this happened. But boy, this is weirder than heck. I mean, nobody would have predicted this. Nobody. Yeah. I want to, uh, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions from the audience about the presidential. So I want to move on and give you plenty of time to talk about the Senate, because I agree with you. That is the crux of this election at this point. Would you please, and, and take your time and do this in an expansive way, but just give us an overall assessment of the status of uh, the fight for control of the Senate and uh, some of the key states that people should be watching next Tuesday night, a week from tonight. You mean like Kansas? 
<laughs> yes. I'm teasing. Um, you know, when we started this cycle, this election cycle, it looked like it would be kind of a ho-hum cycle for the Senate. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, neither side looked like they were overwhelming, you know, uh, uh, disproportionately um, uh, disadvantaged that much. I mean, yes, there were 20, there, you know, there are 23 Republican seats up and 12 Democratic seats, but the, most of the 23 Republican seats, you know, were, looked perfectly safe. Um, and so, but it, if you went back to, let's say the beginning of this year, and the Senate's 5347. So theoretically, Democrats would need three seats if they win the White House and a new vice president would break the tie and four seats if they don't. But we knew that Doug Jones in Alabama, Democratic senator, long story and how he got there that you know. But anyway, I'm not sure God necessarily intended for there to be a Democratic senator in Alabama. But, but anyway, uh, he's going to lose. And so Democrats were going to need four seats four seats if they won, you know, with, with the White House, and they'd need to win five if they didn't. But there were only four Republican seats that looked vulnerable at that point. I mean, you had Martha McSally in Arizona, you had Cory Gardner in Colorado, you had Susan Collins in Maine, and Tom Tillis in North Carolina. So these four, and Democrats would have had to have beaten all four of those, and win the White House, which, you know, wasn't exactly a foregone conclusion back then. Now, that meant running the table. Now, running, you know, it's possible to run the table, but it usually doesn't happen or historically hadn't. But, you know, one little thing is our elections are getting more parliamentary and there's a lot less ticket splitting than there used to be. In fact, a great statistic that the Pew Research Center uh, came up with recently there have been 139 U.S. Senate races since 1980, 139. 122 out of the 139 were won by the Senate candidate of this presidential, of the side that won that state in the most recent presidential, 88%. Wow. And then in 2016, the last presidential election, was the first time since we started the direct election of U.S. Senators in 1914 that every single U.S. Senate race was won by the same party that had carried it in the presidential, every single Senate race. So we are, there's less ticket splitting than ever before, but still going four and oh, that would have been a pretty tall order. So what's happened since then? Well, the first thing is that of those four, each one of them, just started get appearing more and more and more vulnerable. And for the most part, you know, you, you, you have in the Sun Belt, you think uh, Arizona, Colorado, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, these are states that have been pretty Republican and are moving, you know, but have been uh, high growth and a lot of people moving in from other parts of the country changing the voting patterns in that in those states so that for Arizona that used to be real Republican and Texas extremely Republican, Georgia, North Carolina, they're sort of following the footsteps of Virginia that is already that has already has made the transition from red Republican to purple swing and now into into blue Democrat where every single elected official statewide elected official in, in Virginia is now a Democrat. So you had each one of them, the states were changing out from under Cory Gardner in Colorado, changing out from under, uh, well, in Arizona, and Martha McSally had been appointed anyway, had just lost the Senate race there, so that was uh, going to be touch and go, but Georgia, I mean, anyway, so you, you, you have a shifting sands underneath them. Uh, Susan Collins in Maine, uh, you know, you used to be able to, to kind of straddle. I mean, there's a long history, Bill Cohen, a long history of, of, of candidates able to straddle the middle in, in, and particularly moderate Republicans in, in Maine. 
And that middle is become a, a no man's land, or in this case, a no woman's land, where with Kavanaugh and impeachment, and is that there is just no place there. So she was getting more and more vulnerable. Uh, North Carolina, I mentioned. Uh, so each of those four were getting more and more vulnerable. Then you started having developments occur. You had uh, uh, not in any particular order, but Montana, the popular, I mean, Steve Daines, the Republican incumbent, he was perfectly fine. He was not gonna have a race until the really popular Democratic governor who had been running for president, Steve Bullock, jumps in the race. And right now that's an even race. And then you look at Iowa next door to you, Joni Ernst. I didn't think she was gonna have that difficult a race, but you started seeing a little bit of movement before Democrats had their primary in the spring, it started seeing some numbers and pretty soon after Teresa Greenfield got the Democratic nomination, she closed the gap and we had what, two straight Des Moines Register polls that had her three points ahead. Anyway, this is basically a dead even race in a state that had been swing, had moved Republican. Now it looks like it's sort of moving back again. It certainly did in the congressional races last year where Democrats won three out of the four seats. Uh, but where that, that became a really close race at a place we weren't really paying attention to before. Um, uh, the two Georgia seats, didn't think there'd be you know, a problem there, but remember 2018, Stacey Abrams, the African-American former minority leader, the state house comes within a tiny fraction of winning the governorship in Georgia. That state started, started change. We have two Senate seats there and both of them, and under Georgia law, you have to get 50% plus one vote. One of them, the special election, it's a jungle primary that everybody's running to get in. That's definitely going to a runoff on January 5th. And the other one with David Perdue and the Democrat is John Ossoff, a really young a uh, young guy that had almost pulled off an upset in a congressional race a few years, three years ago, that's now neck and neck. And the thing is, it's not about Ossoff and it's really not about Purdue. It's that Georgia, you've got so many people moving in to that state and changing and the state's becoming, you know, just more a one, you know, a much more suburban middle, uh, that some of the places where the president's not exactly a big asset. In fact, we've seen half the polling we've seen lately has shown Joe Biden ahead by a point or two as often or more, slightly more often than the president. Uh, so two there. Um, and Kansas, the open seat there. Um, now, you know, this is a little different because in Kansas, um, and it actually, uh, I think there's, there's, God didn't really intend Kansas to be a democratic state. But sometimes things can happen to a party that just endanger them and kind of a cloud over them for a while. And I, I think there was a lot of uh, backlash against uh, Sam, a lot of Sam Brownback's administration, some of the tax. I mean, basically, you know, cutting taxes is a good thing, but you can't have too much of a good thing. And, you know, you obviously you guys all know the Kansas budget issues better than I do, but you know, he left, the state was a mess financially. Um, it had to be a mess for a Democrat to get elected governor two years ago. Um, and there's still sort of a, a, a cloud, uh, you know, uh, still holding Republicans back. It will probably take a few years before Republicans can really get out from under and get back to, you know, where life normally is and has, all, has been long for forever um, in terms of Republicans in Kansas. Um, and, um, you know, that's a, that's a close race. I mean, is, Mar is Marshall ahead by, you know, probably two, three points? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's under, you know, President Trump is going to win Kansas, not by the kind of margins that Republicans normally do, but he's going to win by, you know, high, mid to high, high single digits. Um, and and Mar Marshall is coming in, you know, behind him, under him by a few points, but it's a really close race. And I wouldn't be stunned if Democrats picked up, um, if, if, if Barbara Bo uh, Boyer uh, picked up that, I always mispronounce her name, uh, uh, wins that seat. But I mean, I think I'd probably give, give Republicans maybe a 60-40 chance of holding on, 55-45. 
Um, and then you have finally, uh, you know, Alaska is looking weird, but um, Alaska is a hard state to poll. It's a hard state to read from the lower 48. You know, we're not exactly sure what's going on there. And then in Texas, you know, I think John Corner is probably going to win. Most of the polling showing him ahead by, you know, a handful of points. But it is a state that's moving that is moving and the state house is definitely in jeopardy. And you saw Ted Cruz come within an eyelash of losing two years ago. Uh, but you know, that's the, you know, the, the, the Kansas and, and Texas and probably Alaska are, are, are less problematic, but you've got nine Republican seats that are in extreme danger. And if Republicans lose you know, four out of those nine, and they're behind in like three, at least three or four of them right now, um, and the several more, you know, basically dead even. Uh, this is a tough, tough situation. Um, I, and, and part of it um, is that toss-up, as you know, Bill, toss-up races, the races that are just the very, at the very knife's edge going into election day, they tend to break one way or the other. I mean, we've noticed in our ratings that of the Senate races that we had rated as toss up going into election day, oh, so, you know, the last 11 elections, 70% of them have broken the same direction each year. You know, either, uh, you know, anywhere the lowest was 59, the highest was I think 89% of the toss ups would go either all would go Democratic or go Republican. And that they don't just split down the middle, uh, that it's whichever side has that last sort of gust of wind uh, or something seems to push them one way or the other. But, you know, we originally were thinking, well, there's maybe a one in three chance of Democrats getting a majority. And then as the political environment and the president wasn't doing well and, um, bunch of things coming together and some bad breaks in a couple of states, it started looking closer to 50-50 and then maybe a little worse than 50-50. And right now, I think if Republicans can manage to lose only one or two seats net and come out of this at 51, for, you know, fit with 51 or 52 seats, uh, that'd be, I'm, I'm not going to say a miracle, but that'd be real surprising right now because they they they're they're going through a really 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 tough time, but now we're looking at when you've got nine seats or twelve seats that are in jeopardy, nine seats in extreme jeopardy. The other side only has one in extreme jeopardy and one in Michigan that's like somewhat somewhat competitive or fairly relatively competitive. And these things, knowing that they tend to break and which way these states or into each individual state's looking like going, you could see Democrats picking up a, a five or a six or a seven or, a, you know, uh, a, a, an eight Senate seats. Um, I mean, you could see that happening and it's not normal. And these kinds of wave elections usually happen in midterm years, not presidential. But you and I both remember election night 1980, uh, when I remember the you know the polls closed in in Indiana and Kentucky first, and uh, Birch Bayh was a Democratic incumbent that you remember well. That uh, at, at he law he was he was basically that race was called as him losing at six. 30 in the evening, the moment the polls closed, it was clearly he was going, he was losing. They were, it was called and Democrats lost one Senate seat every half hour for the next six hours, a 12 seat net loss. Now, I don't, I mean, Republicans are going to lose 12 seats, but could they suffer under these circumstances with these seats this close with a ticket that's looking problematic and getting outspent by a big margin? Yeah, that could happen. So this, I did not think that we would be spending a whole lot of time thinking about the Senate. But right now when I'm speaking to, you know, business groups or whatever, I'm saying, hey, um, you know, You've been looking this in a binary fashion of who's going to be in control, who's going to have a majority in the Senate. Let me tell you, if the Senate, if Democrats have a majority, have 50-50 with Kamala Harris breaking a tie or 51 or 52 seats, 
then Joe Manchin, who's a pretty centrist guy, and there are a couple other relatively moderate Democrats, they would have a lot of leverage. But, and, and one or two of the incoming might be, you know, Steve Bullitt from Montana, he'd be relatively centrist. But if this number starts getting big, then you're starting to talk about policy differences that are dramatically different from if Democrats just at 50-51, and if they get rid of the filibuster, Katie bar the door. Uh, that's a whole different world. So that's why I'm telling people, you want to, you know, if you want to focus on something, man, you ought to focus on the Senate because there's a lot more better chance of that being right on the edge than the presidential. Okay, um, I have one final question, although I reserve the right to do follow-ups to the Q&A with the audience, but one final question. So if you have a question, if you're watching Charlie tonight and you have a question for him, uh, please submit it uh, through the chat function on Zoom. And um, Charlie, let me conclude tonight by asking you, you know, Democrats are doing very well in the House right now. Republicans seem to still be doing very well in the state legislatures. Uh, how do you anticipate what looks like a very bad election for Republicans? Um, uh, how do you anticipate that affecting both of those areas? Well, in the House, um, you know, when one party loses 40 seats in the House, you think, well, God, I mean, they're automatically going to pick up five or 10 of them back or 15, and they needed 17 to get back. But as the environment got worse, and as so many of these Democratic freshmen, and keep in mind, where this majority flipped, where the, the control of the House flipped, it was largely in suburbs. It was suburbs of Atlanta and Dallas and Houston and Kansas City and Oklahoma City and Richmond, Virginia. And that's just the, sort of the Sun Belt Southern tier. Um, it was in suburbs. Well, the thing is, these a lot of these freshman Democrats for all the AOC and the squad and all that kind of business, for every one of those, there was a, a freshman Democrat whose background was in the military or in the intelligence community or represents a, a, a Southern, you know, suburban district that, you know, they're certainly more liberal than the Republicans that they replace, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not, no, no, none of them are candidates for membership in the squad, um, but that they tend to get a little overshadowed, but they started out raising, raising tons and tons and tons of money and, you know, that's kind of a theme of the last four or five years is that uh, Democrats have started raising money online. Uh, you, it's like they're printing money. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, what, did they, what did we read that it, the hours after Justice Ginsburg died, you know, it was like $100,000 a minute, you know, I mean, was just flowing um, into Democratic coffers. So, uh, the House, I think Republicans are, are going to probably lose somewhere between five and 15 more. But one place that's really important to watch is the state legislatures, because 80 percent of state House seats around the country are up every two years, 80 percent. And then you obviously have state Senate seats that are that are staggered. But, you know, a party, a national party never wants to have a bad election. But when you really don't want to have a bad election is any election year that ends in a zero, because that's a census year. And the next year is when they redraw the maps for the next decade for Congress, for legislature. And when you get hammered, as Democrats did in 2010, that's a defeat that keeps on defeating. When they got lost so many governorships and state legislative chambers and seats around the country, they got lines that were the, the, the worst lines that they had seen in, you know, probably practically forever. Uh, and it took a long time for them to recover from that. And so that, when I talk to my, you know, friends that you and I have in common, Republicans and strategists, the operatives, they're really, really worried that if the president's problems are indeed metastasizing down and hurting down ballot Republicans, and that can happen, was we saw that to Democrats in 1980, uh, that can be something that takes a long time to get out from under. 
And um, uh, so the House, uh, you know, governorship's not a big switch, but, but state legislative, it usually tracks pretty closely with, uh, with presidential uh, results. That, uh, uh, so that's something that, that Republican officials quietly are really worried about. And I think they well should be. So I have my first audience question. Uh, from your perspective as a nonpartisan, does partisanship inherently create conflict or do you think there are ways in which powerful partisanship is useful? Oh boy. Um, well, the, the whole world's changed from when, you know, Bill and I came to Washington and, uh, you know, back in the old days, and I don't want it to sound like we're two old duffers talking about the good old days, but in the old days, you had a ton of conservative and moderate Democrats that were a ballast that kept the Democratic Party from going off into a ditch on the left side. And you had a lot of liberal, moderate Republicans that were, you know, from the Northeast and New England and the Pacific Coast that were a ballast that kept the Republican Party going off. And you had an overlapping of the party. I mean, when I was in college and working for a very conservative Democrat from Louisiana, Bennett Johnston, who you remember well, he, across the hall from us were the offices of Senator Edward Brooke, who was a liberal Republican, African-American Senator from Massachusetts the Republican was a heck of a lot more liberal than the Democrat was. And, and, but you used to see that, this overlapping. And the thing is the people that were towards the middle, not just in the middle, but just between the two 35 yard lines, they were the people that worked together and that were consensus builders and could drive, I mean, they would they drive hard bargains? And Senator Dole was the epitome of this, where was he a strong, real, serious Republican? Absolutely. But he did have relationships on the other side. He could work across party lines. He could do deals and was willing to and was good at it. And that's an art that's lost. So I, I think it, it's the parties becoming ideologically sorted out so that rather than having a center left party, a center right party, we now have a left party and a right party. And then it's reinforced by redistricting, creating, you know, sort of partisan ghettos on each side that are just made up primarily of partisans. And then we've got the, 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 the talk radio, the impact that it had, and now cable news. And now a trusted news source is someone who's going to tell me what I want to hear in the news. And people are shop. I mean, they're picking where they're watching because they want they want the good old they want the gospel. And whether it's a liberal gospel or a conservative gospel, they 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 you know they know what they want. And social media reinforcing it. So I think it's pulling us apart so that. As, as traumatic as that 1980 Bush Gore uh, uh, election controversy was, I shudder to think what it would be like if we had something like that in this election, because this, you know we thought things were pretty partisan then. Shoot, those were the good old days. I, I, I you know. Um, Man, this would be pretty hard. So I, I would have thought that, well, first of all, 9-11 was potentially an opportunity to bring the car, punch curve back together. And, you know, I don't, I don't blame either side, but the controversy, should we invade Iraq? Yes or no? And that just pulled the country back apart. And you might have thought that the coronavirus might provide an opportunities to pull the country together. And that hadn't happened. And I, you know, I'd been for a long time, my hope was that we would just have some strong, great leader from one side or the other that could unify the country, but that failing that it would take some horrible crisis. And here we have a horrible crisis and I don't see any mending happening here. Um, and I, I don't want to live on, you know, I certainly want to go on for a lot more questions and I sure don't want to leave this on a down note, but 
but we're, you know, I've got a lot of hope that the generation of students that you've got that, that are, are using the Dole Institute and are at KU and even the people at K-State where my nephew went, I, I'm teasing, but that I'm hoping that this generation, this another generation can do maybe a little better than, you know, the generation that you, that you Bill and I represent that, uh, um, cause, cause we, we've got to, you know, something's got to happen here. Something really does. And I'm hopeful the next generation will. Okay, Charlie, our next audience question. What's the importance of the campaigns in the swing state? Well, it's, it's, um, it's everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting where the campaigns they know that this election is going to be won or lost in six states. You know, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina, and that's the bulk. I mean, there there are four more states that are are very competitive, or four more Republican states, and. Uh, you know, we kind of paying attention to Minnesota a little bit and, and Nevada a little bit for a bit on the on the Democratic side, but it's pretty much going to be these six states, and and um, but this, the the candidates can't ignore the rest of the country because first of all, the rest of the country is generally where the money comes from, and it also looks you know, it, it would look awful if you're, you know, you have to like pretend that you're running a national campaign, but it's basically those six. Uh, and, uh, and for election night, uh, I'm looking for a piece of paper here. Um, oh, here we go. The, 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 if you just drew a, a line and said from the most Republican to the most Democratic states, the tipping point state is probably Pennsylvania, but with Michigan, Wisconsin, all right there. Those are the states that tipping. The, the problem is those states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, they're the slowest counting states in the planet. And so, I mean, you look back at 2016 and just going by, when did the Eastern time, when did the Associated Press call each one? And uh, Pennsylvania didn't get, get, get called until 1.35 in the morning Eastern time. Uh, Wisconsin, not till 2.29. And heck, Michigan didn't get called for another two weeks. Uh, it was like November 24th when Michigan finally got called. And so if you're looking for clues on election night of where this thing may be going, my advice, and again, this is keen off of at what time, and I'm going Eastern time, at what time were states called in the Clinton-Trump election in 2016, I'm suggesting to people at nine o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock Central, Watch, that's when Texas got called last time. And the polls closed about an hour earlier, but but they their early vote gets comes in real quickly. Um, watch Texas. And if you see the presidents winning Texas by a four, five, six, or better point margin, if we're on track there, then if I'm a Republican, I'm starting to feel like, well, maybe things may they may not be too bad. If you see it heading towards a one point race or the president losing in Texas, well, first of all, if the pre president loses Texas, you can go ahead and put your pajamas on because because he's not getting reelected without Texas. He can't do that. Then after Texas, um, I mean, th then after Texas, I would go down to uh, um, Florida at, well, wait a minute. No, there was one at nine something. Uh, Ohio at 9.36 was Eastern time, was when Ohio got called. The president's got to win Ohio. It's been real close. The president may be a point or two more likely to be ahead than behind, but real close. That's a must-win state for, for the president. Uh, then next, you'd go to Florida. That was at 10.50 Eastern time. He's got to win Florida. Um, and 11.11 Eastern, North Carolina, and 11.33 Georgia, every one of these is a must-win state. He can win all of these 
And if he comes up short in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, the night's over. So, but he's got to kind of run through, go through each, clear each of these hurdles before getting to Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, that will be slow coming in and probably slower this time than last time. So uh, I, I think that we may have, we may or may not have a declared winner on election night, but I think there are going to be some clues in these early states that, you know, if the president's losing any of them, then it's over. But if he clears all of them, then Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin get interest. You know, Biden's ahead by some there, but that's where the night would get real interesting. Okay, our next question you you kind of addressed in our discussion, but um, I want to ask you because somebody submitted it. In what ways do you view President Trump differently compared to 2016? Well, I mean, you know, one of the things uh, after 2016, and I will, I will confess, look, after the last month before the election and after the Billy Bush Access Hollywood tape came out, you know, I mean, I thought whatever window was there was shut. And, and, um, uh, and and being caught off guard, uh, I, a lot of people in my business, we did a lot of soul searching and a lot of them are still traumatized by it, still suffering from a, a PTSD. And I actually, I checked with my son, the 80s. I know Senator Dole was, was uh, he was 10th Mountain Division, wasn't he? Correct. No, well, my son was in the 82nd Airborne in Afghanistan. And so I cleared it with him. It was okay for me to use the term PTSD here. But uh, he uh, um, I was going to say, oh, yeah, uh, it was like figuring out what, ha what did happen, what didn't happen, and what did we miss and not. And in 2016, something that I intellectually knew, but I didn't put as much uh, 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 emphasis on, I guess, I, I know, is s six times since the end of World War II, we had seen a party hold the White House for two consecutive terms for eight years. And five times out of six, the American people voted for change. The only time they voted to give a party a third term post-World War II was after eight years of Ronald Reagan when they elected George H.W. Bush and his vice president, George H.W. Bush. So that was the one time. Now, we thought, well, Obama's job approval ratings are in the mid 50s, you know, mid, uh, you know, or 56 or seven or so. The time for change sentiment may not be quite as big, but it was there. And Hillary Clinton represented the status quo. And Donald Trump represented change. And that unless you were from the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren kind of change, if you were any other kind of change, he was a vehicle for that and, and was able to tap into things. But now he's not change. I mean, he's not exactly the status quo, but he's not change. And that when, um, um, when we look at, 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 at what's going on here and what people wanted change, it turned out they wanted a lot of more change uh, than, and, and Hillary Clinton, as I said, had a lot of baggage and she represented the status quo. I think when I talk to pollsters, when I talk to campaign consultants now, you know, one of the things that our team, what we're hearing is people saying, who can make my life normal again? And Look, I don't think anybody can make our lives normal again, but I, I think that people, they do have a little bit of rubbery legs, like when you get off a roller coaster. And, and I, I think that's part of that the president, you know, one thing that's gone through capitalism since our earliest years has been creative destruction and, and disruptive technology. And he has been a politically disruptive force that I think a lot of people found appealing in 2016. Whether that's still appealing or not, we're going to find out uh, a week from tonight. Um, but that can, um, um, I think that as an incumbent, um, how, um, 
I, I, I mean, I just think that, that the coronavirus, if the president, um, I, I think he would have had a difficult race anyway, but I, I think on the handling the coronavirus, this has given it, it was like somebody was already, uh, somebody was already on, on somewhat thin ice and it warmed the ice and made it thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And I, as far as I can tell, it looks like it broke through at that first debate, that that's when people hit the mute button to change metaphors. And I don't know that it's been a winnable race since that point, to be perfectly honest. And this isn't about Joe Biden winning. It's about, it's, it's up or down. And um, I, you know, I think it's just tough. I mean, if you've got 5% of the world's population and 20% of the coronavirus deaths, that's, you know, those are pretty tough circumstances to win reelection. Um, and, you know, even, even when, uh, you know, the, 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 best, the best Gallup job approval rating the president's ever had was 49. The best Fox News is 48. The best NBC Wall Street Journal is 47. If you can't get above that with six consecutive months of 50 year low unemployment levels as we had from September of last year to February of this year, then you have a crisis that does, isn't going well. I don't know that that's winnable, to be honest. Okay, um, our next audience question, and I've got time for a few more if anybody has them, they wanna submit them. Um, this is a question that comes up very often. Uh, could third parties become more relevant in 2024 with high profile individuals such as Kanye West running with out the Democratic or Republican Party endorsement? You know, uh, I think the answer and he, they didn't need to fill out a name because because um, the name to me doesn't matter. Under our electoral college system where. Uh, there are certain states that are going to go Democratic absolutely no matter what. And there are other states that are going to go Republican no matter what. And if nobody gets 270 electoral votes, Bill, as you know, it goes to the House and each state gets one vote. And Kansas has to like that. Kansas gets one vote. California gets one vote. New York gets one vote. But the thing about it is, there is no way on this planet that an independent candidate in, 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 in any kind of a, the kind of partisanship that we have this, you know, in the last 50, 100 years, there's no way an independent can win. They just can't because X are going to go Democrat and Y are going to go Republican. And Mike Bloomberg desperately wanted to run as an independent. And, and I actually had a conversation with him years ago when he was first looking at this. And he said, can an independent win? And he convinced me at the time, and he has revisited it several times, but it doesn't look like no matter how bad a shape the two parties are in or how good you are or how much money you have, an independent cannot get 270 electoral votes and if somehow, it'd be a miracle if they could, if they got to the House, a House isn't going to vote. You know, a House is filled with Democrats and Republicans. Uh, it, it's not going to go for an independent. So I think we're kind of, because of the Electoral College, we are locked into a two-party system. Now, I think what does happen is I think each of our parties have enormous self-destructive tendencies and if left to their own devices, will in fact self-destruct. I mean, you know, you think back of 1992, Democrats already had the House and the Senate, Bill Clinton gets elected, and what happens? Uh, Democrats embark on a very aggressive, ambitious agenda that some might say was too liberal, uh, cultural reference that the younger people might not get, but they load up in a car like Thelma and Louise and drive off a cliff. And then fast forward to 2008, Democrats had the House, the Senate, Barack Obama gets elected. Uh, Democrats get, get uh, you, know, low, you know, they embark on another aggressive, ambitious, and some might say too liberal agenda, and they jump back in the car and drive off a different car, drive off the same cliff. And to be fair and bipartisan, 
2016, Republicans had the House, they had the Senate, uh, Donald Trump gets elected president, and they embark on an aggressive, ambitious agenda that some might say was too conservative. And basically, they just drive off a different cliff. So, you know, and that's one, one so that, that both parties have, uh, if left to their own devices, will go, will, sooner or later, they will get, they will overreach or get arrogant and go too far and pay a price. And three times in a row, a party's had all three gone off a cliff. So for my Republican friends, you know, if you're, you know, getting pretty depressed right here, and guess what? There's plenty of reason to be depressed. What you'd look for is do Democrats load up in a car and do a Thelma and Louise off the cliff. The young people are going to be scurrying to go uh, watch that movie. Uh, and do they go off a cliff and, 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 and provide a comeback opportunity for Republicans in 2022? Or are they more pragmatic and a little more judicious and take a little more time before they drive off a cliff? But ultimately, that's what parties do, is go eventually go too far. But I don't think we're ever, you know, and the Electoral College isn't going to go anywhere. I mean, it was a compromise with the founders between small states and big states, and that small states don't want to get rid of the Electoral College, and certainly Republicans don't want to, I mean, you know, Donald Trump carried 30 states. Um, I haven't seen one of those sign on to this uh, popular vote compact. Uh, so uh, whether you like the Electoral College or not, it's here to stay, I think, and, and besides, if we got rid of the Electoral College, what would happen? These presidential candidates would just fly around between six or seven metropolitan areas, you know, big cities, big metropolitan areas, and that's the only place they'd go. At least with what we've got now, yeah, they're focused on six states, but the six states they are focused on with, uh, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, uh, Ohio and, 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 and North Carolina, it's a little more representative than if it was just going between, you know, the LA Metro and, and, you know, big six big cities. So I don't think we're ever going to see an independent party. Uh, I think we could get, I think the system, there, I tell you what, there'd be nothing wrong with the U.S. Senate that four or five or six independent senators wouldn't fix or two dozen or three dozen independent members of the House oh, I think that'd be actually quite healthy for the system. But with the Electoral College, we're just not going to get an independent president anytime soon. Okay, I have one final question from our audience tonight, Charlie. Um, what do you recommend young voters get the most of their vote? What steps should they take to fully understand which candidate is right for them? Um, turn off cable read, you know, look at, you know, whether it's uh, read the Wall Street Journal from cover to cover, read the New York Times, read the, I mean, but read, don't watch, uh, don't watch cable anyway. I think watching the three broadcast evening news, I think that's very healthy. I think that, you know, we're, we're not in a society where people all get Time Magazine and Newsweek anymore. And I think there does have to be some connective tissue that is not specifically designed to go in one ideological direction. So I think it's read. Um, I do think the news hour every evening is, is really good. But I mean, in a perfect world, everybody would watch the PBS news hour every night and read The Economist from cover to cover every week. But that's not the world we live in. Um, and, but um, I think it, it, it's, it's, it is probably, it's understanding that truth and justice in the American way is never entirely in one party. And if you look, I mean, that's one of the things that as a, as a high school debater that I learned, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, is when you, when you research a topic and you have that issue, public policy issue for a whole year and you study it, what you'll generally find is there is merit to both sides of an issue. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, it doesn't matter what it is that, that if, you, if you're not seeing 
any conflict, any nuance, you're not looking very closely. And um, I, I think it's, it's being willing, you know, I would tell people and whether they're conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat, I would say, don't vote for anybody that would not be willing to sit down and talk with people in the other party. And, and you know, that's the tradition that's the tradition that, that Bob Dole belonged in. Was he a partisan? Heck yes, he was, he's a partisan, but he was able to work with people and he was a phenomenally effective, you know, one of the most effective legislators in, 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 our, in the history of the US Senate, but it was because of that. And you know, what was an interesting thing for the Dole Center is Tom Harkin from next door in Iowa, Liberal Democrat. I mean, he would. I tell you, what, he was more liberal as a Democrat than Bob Dole was, or is in each case as a Republican. But the thing is, when they were creating a Harkin Institute in Iowa, you know where they came? They went to the Dole Institute to look and see how do you know how do you do this, and and studying how successful people, how our leaders in the past when the system did work better, how did they govern? And, and uh, but I think this is the, the Dole Institute is an incredible resource. The, the down in the bowels of the Dole, I mean, there, it is fantastic to just look at the resources you've got there and to take advantage of the people that are coming through Lawrence or coming online. And you've got an incredible resource. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, as far as I'm concerned, maybe the best book ever written about politics was What It Takes by Richard Ben Kramer. And the section on Bob Dole. And the thing is that he, he was never comfortable. He was of a generation where he never talked about himself. And people of that generation didn't. And, and, and you know, real lawyers don't talk about it. And until that book came out and Richard Ben Kramer told his story, I think a lot of us that had watched Bob Dole for a long time had no idea what he'd gone through. And the fabulous thing about that book, and, and man, any political science major, any history major ought to be required to read this book. But where it was interesting, where the author followed what was it, a half dozen, eight presidential candidates that were running in 1988 and went to their hometowns and met with their relatives, their neighbors, their scout leaders, their teachers, their, and in the military, their, their army or Navy buddies and whatever. And it was, you know, Bob Dole, Dole George H.W. Bush, uh, 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 Dick Gephardt, Michael Dukakis, I mean, this group of people. And what he found, it was not snarky. It was looking at what made them different. And what he found was, was every one of them, with one exception, had had some kind of, of traumatic, life-changing experience that galvanized their lives and gave them a resolve that what it takes to compete at that level. And, and for Bob Dole, obviously, it was, it was the, 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 the war injury and the, the perseverance it took to come back. For George H.W. Bush, it wasn't getting shot down in the South Pacific, which I would have thought would have been, you know, it was having a young daughter dying of cancer at the age of what was she, two, three, four years old, that sort of thing. For Dick Gephardt, it was having a son with cancer that thankfully, you know, came beyond, you know, Michael Dukakis had a brother that committed suicide in the trial, you know, and, and where it was all something that made them stronger people. And with one exception that I won't go into, you got to read the book. Uh, and, uh, but studying history and studying great figures, that's such an important thing to do. And the Dole Center gives you an opportunity to do that, both in the life of, of, of Senator Dole and uh, a few years back when he, the year he turned, the summer he turned 90, the year he turned 90, I brought my, uh, our staff members and we all, five, the six of us trooped over to Senator Dole's office at the law firm. And we sat there and listened to him. And he was 
asking David Wasserman, our house editor, about specific house house races and what's going on that one and that one. Was that the district that, you know, and boy, what a junkie. He loves this stuff. And uh, anyway, I, I've droned on way too long, but uh, it, it's, it's such an opportunity for you guys to have the center, to have the Institute. It's such a great place and, uh, uh, and for a remarkable man. Well, Charlie, I want to thank you for uh, your very kind comments about the Senator and the Institute, and I'll second your comments about what it takes. We were very lucky at the beginning of my tenure here to have Richard Ben Kramer here, and uh, he, he was just an exceptional person. So we very much appreciate that. You're a great friend of the Dole Institute. I owe you multiple t-shirts for appearing with us tonight. I'll tell you what, you yeah, my, I, I, my wife is still living in, the one that, that looks like a, is the stained glass, you know, fabulous. But anyway, but um, anytime, anytime the Dole Institute wants me physically or virtually, I would be delighted to come and do anything, anything I can to help. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to do that. And, uh, um, you know, uh, Senator Dole is just someone I have enormous respect for. Yeah, well, Charlie, thanks so much. You're a great friend of the Institute. Thanks to all of our viewers tonight and to uh, uh, Professor uh, Gaston's class and for to her for asking her students to watch. And we thank you all for joining us. We would encourage you to join us Thursday night for a program at seven o'clock on why millennials have been avoiding politics. And we'll be talking a lot about Hey, that may be changing in 2020. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this evening. If you're a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Join us on Thursday this week for a conversation with author and professor Shauna Shamas, where she will discuss her book, out of the Running, Why Millennials Reject Political Careers and Why It Matters. You can access this program on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel, just like tonight's program. Refer to, the, refer to doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming programs. If you enjoyed tonight's program, consider becoming a friend of the Dole Institute by donating to help make programs like this possible. We hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you and good night.